Hello, Neptune family. Today we have a special guest. We have John Huber from Crowned Heads. Hello, John. John, how are you? Thank you for having me on the show. Of course. We're super excited to talk to you today. We have a good list of questions, so let's get to them. The first right. of them being that uh, you've had a lot of great success regarding the Mil Diaz, and that was fantastic. I've heard of so many people smoking the cigar. It's on my list, like on my top five to try. So I'm definitely super psyched. Crown Heads has been a really cool brand. I know that you guys haven't been around for a crazy long time, but in the time that you have been around, it's been phenomenal. So my first I, question I, I, for you I, I, today I, is- Let me interject yeah, that. And I'll say that we're a 10 year overnight success. That's, that is crazy in this industry. There's people that have been years and years and decades. This this industry, and I've seen other friends of mine describe it the same way. It's like dog years. So every year is like seven <laughs> years. It ages you seven years. It feels like seven years. So technically, I guess you could say we've been in business for 70 years. So that, that, that would make more sense with the success. You know what I mean? <laughs> 70 years. Sense. Okay. Right. Now right. this is where we're at. Sure. So the Mill Diaz was your latest release, no? Correct. Correct. And mm -hmm. do you have any cool releases plans for this upcoming year, 2021? Oh, gosh. We've already had cool releases this year. We've already done uh, Juarez Shots. We've done La Carren Bella Cosos Finos. We've done uh, a private cigar for JR's 50th anniversary called Mother Church. Uh, we did Mel Diaz Escogidos, Edición Limitada 2021. That's just shipped out now. And, of course, the, the, the Lost Angel, the TA exclusive. So that's just... From January to May the 20th. May. That is insane. That's like it five is. months. Are it the months is. also measured in dog years? <laughs> yes. So that's 35 months of work right there, three years. Gotcha. So. <laughs> yeah. And um, and as we were saying before we got on camera, we've got another one coming out next Wednesday, the 26th. And then we announced Las Calaveras 2021, uh, June 9th. So, and that's that takes us up to the PCA. So in MPCA, we've got uh, a new regular production line coming out. Um, and we also have a PCA exclusive cigar coming out. And then we come back and we go back to work. And then I've got about four more new things planned before we end 2021. So that's perfect. I know the Crown Heads fans right now are like writing down dates and names, regular production. I hope when. so. <laughs> Thanks for following. Definitely. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to ask you, you said you guys have been in a business for 10 years. I wanted mm. to know how that came to be. So who thought of Crowned Heads and why? Well, uh, this goes, my, my, when I first got in the business, I started in 1996 with CAO. And so I got my undergraduate degree at CAO and then um, CAO was acquired by Henry Winterman. Henry Winterman was acquired by Swedish Match. Swedish Match also had General Cigar. So if you read between the lines, basically CAO was no more as of 2010, they, they took it and moved to Richmond. Um, so during that last year, I, I really didn't know what I was going to do, except I was going to stay in the business. And uh, my boss at the time, Mike Condor, who, um, who he was the head of marketing and I worked for Mike and Mike and I had, had a really good relationship, good friendship. We always got on since day one. You know, about six months into 2010, he said, do you want to do something when this is over with? I said, yeah. And it was literally like on a handshake that we would do something. So I always knew in the back of my mind, that's what I would, would end up doing. But then once it, you know, wheels hit the road, so to speak, um, I said, yeah, but I'll do it if I can do it my way. I want to, I want to do, I don't want to do CAO 2.0. I want to do what I've always wanted to do. And he gave me carte blanche, really. And so we, December 17th, 2010 was my last day at CAO and December 21st was my first meeting of what would eventually become crowned heads. And, um, and we started shipping. We, the first year of 2011 was pretty much just doing the work to figure out who would make the cigars. And so we visited Central America, we visited very different factories, what have you. And um, it's a long story how we got there. But when we decided to, we wanted to do cigars with Ernesto Perez Carrillo initially, um, he wasn't doing a contract brand with anybody at that point. He was just doing EPC. And so that was the next hurdle to overcome was to ask him and convince him to make cigars for these two gringos in Nashville, Tennessee. Luckily he did, he agreed. And we went back down there and to go to work and start developing the blend. And Ernie said, you know, look, you're going to put in the legwork. You're going to choose the tobaccos. You're going to choose the blend. You're going to do all of this. 
And if it succeeds, congratulations. If it fails, he goes, it's not on me. And I was like, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. And so we did. So I, I went to work right away with Ernie and, and uh, he taught me so much in, in a short time, really. And um, we started shipping four kicks in November of 2011. And that's, that was our launch basically late, late 2011. So this November will officially be 10 years. That's amazing. So then you said that you basically got like your bachelor's from a uh, CAO, CAO and yeah. then, yeah, with, with Ernesto, it was kind of like both a master's and a PhD at this point. Cause completely how much I, more can you, can you get, you know, having your own brand and having it grow this much. It's one of those things where you got to be careful what you wish for, because my whole time at CAO, I had so much fun working with the Osgener family and, and all the guys that we worked with. And it was more, I, I described my time there. It was more like being in a fraternity than working for a company because we were all, I mean, we we're like brothers. We were like, we'd go everywhere together. We'd party together. We'd smoke together. You know, we were just very tight. And I never really didn't dawn on me to like to have your own brand or anything. And then when the opportunity came about, I was like, wow, you know, and now I realize how difficult it is to be on this side of the fence because, you know, you work for a company and, and as long as you do a good job, you're going to get a paycheck, you know, every two weeks, whatever. But then when you're responsible for being the guy to create, what feeds everybody it, it becomes a lot more pressure and a lot more stress and uh so it's yes be careful what you wish for because it, there's a lot that goes along with it that you don't really think about until you get there of course i mean it's like a uh, risk and reward and sometimes you know this reward is, is really nice having your own brand and having so many people recognize it and love it and keep up with it because i know that the crowned head fans are very like they love crowned heads Thank you. There, I, it's, I, it's not like, uh, oh, yeah, I've tried it before. Like, I love this brand. I smoke this brand every day. And I'm like, okay, a daily I, smoker. Okay, cool. I think part of the success of that is, you know, and I'm, I'm very grateful for everybody that supported us um, to this day, because without them, we can't do what we do. Um, but I think part of it is just that we, aside from having exceptionally good cigars, I have to give credit to the factories for doing all that. But what we do here from our headquarters and from all of our sales guys and everything, we provide what we think we're like some of the best as far as customer service, taking care of people, treating people like we would want to be treated, you know, just going out of the way to, to, to write thank you notes and, you know, and instead of sending an email or text, write a note, put it in the mail, just old school stuff like that. I've always believed in that. And I, when somebody does it from another industry to me, I take notice. And so we try to do the same thing for other people from here. So I think, that's what's kind of built it brick by brick. And that's why we have the support that we do from, from a lot of good people. Yeah, it's like the golden rule for, for anybody, right? Treat 100%. others how you want to be treated and 100%. in a business model, even better. Especially like in this day and age, like, you know, you know now when, when you make a phone call to a company, it's like, what do you hear? You hear an automated voice that says, due to the ongoing COVID crisis, we're, you know, our backlog is da 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 and our wait time to speak to somebody is 45 minutes. You know, it's like, no. Uh, -uh it's, that's not acceptable. So we, we've always pre-pandemic, pandemic, whatever, always try to provide really good customer support, really pay attention to our consumers. If somebody has an issue with our products and they contact me, I will go out of my way to personally pack and replenish those cigars and follow it up. How did they smoke for you? How was it? Cause I take a vested interest in it. These are my, my children that are going out the door to an extent. And I want to make sure that they're, you know, held in high regard. So I know people that spend their money on our products. It, it means a lot to me. And I don't want that to be, you know, left unnoticed. I hear you. These are, these are your kids and you want to make sure they make you proud. <laughs> 100%. 100 So you were saying how um, you were nervous about going to Ernesto first because you guys didn't want to be shut down for being two gringos from Nashville. Right. What's that experience been like? So you guys are headquartered in Nashville, Tennessee. How has that influenced your brand? I think that probably the obvious influence is musically, you know, I mean, because, you know, we're known as Music City here in Nashville. And so just by osmosis, I mean, I've been influenced by music, whether it be lyrically or sonically, you know, uh, we've had various brands that were musically inspired, like Four Kicks or Headley Grange and things like that. So I think that's kind of uh, influenced us a little bit. Um, but aside from that, I mean, I find my influences from all, all kinds of different places, whether it be, you know, history, you know, stories of Cuban cigars, or it, maybe it comes from the surf culture or skate culture or, or music or art, you know, it's just, I'm always like, it's all around there. I just kind of let channel into me and then 
that comes out some way, shape or form. So as far as being in Nashville, I mean, I, I feel like we could have done this anywhere from any city, but it's, it's Nashville is home. And I didn't want to leave home and go to Richmond, Virginia and work for a, a corporate machine. You know, I, that's, that, that's never was on my list. I'm too anti-corporate. Nice. I'm too anti-corporate to do that ever. <laughs> well, then that's, that's why you did your own thing either way. You said, no, screw that. I exactly. don't want to just go with the flow and, because yeah. a lot of people took that opportunity and a lot of people take opportunities like that all the time. And then they're just, you know, some people unhappy in, in their jobs because they're in the same, hundred you know, percent, kind I, of I same mean, wheel that keeps going. I've never, I mean, I've got nothing against corporate America and if that's what people do and that makes them happy, you know, it's fine. But just for me personally, ever since I can remember being a little kid, um, I had this conversation with somebody the other day, oddly enough, but I remember telling my high school counselor, he said, what do you want to do? Uh, for you with your life like what do you want to be you know and I was like 16 and I said I don't know what I want to do I said but I know what I don't want to do and he's like what's that I said I don't want to be like everybody else I want to be the best at what I, I do and I don't want a nine to five and so some way shape or form I think I eventually kind of landed on exactly those those three goals because I, I I'm not saying I'm the best at what I do um, hopefully maybe I'm in the conversation on some subset over here but I don't have a 95, nine to five. I look forward to coming to work. Um, I love doing what I do and uh, I'm not like everybody else. So, you know, I checked all those boxes. <laughs> yeah. And that's what matters at the end of the day is just like that you're happy because when you are happy and you're creating these cigars and creating blends and uh, figuring out what you want your band designs to be like, that all shows you know, like how happy you are with your work shows and the cigars that you create, because then people are like, okay, you know, it's not, I don't know. I, I feel like when someone hates their job and they're just like ready to go, you can the see quality that. might not be there. Yeah. They might oh, yeah. not care. You know, cigar might be like unraveling and they don't care. Yeah. You can call them and be on the phone for hours, you know, waiting. True. So definitely once, you know, you realize that, Hey, I love my job. You do a lot better. Truly. Oh, it shows in, in, in your work, you know, I mean, when you find something that you love to do, you never work a day in your life. It sounds like an old cliche, but and it's, one it's of the true. First, it's very true. And that's something that God bless him. Uh, John Osgener, rest in peace, the founder of CAO. That's one of the things he taught me back in the day. I remember he's like, he taught me like, you know, find a job you, you love, you know, work a day in your life and make things happen. You know, your, your only limitation he taught me was yourself. I mean, you could go for it and just just make things happen. And we did that in, in, in abundance at CAO. And we try to continue to do that now at Crown Heads. And you guys are doing a fantastic job. I mean, thank you. We have, I'm telling you, I the amount of friends that I have, like my personal friends that love Crown Heads, like on top of all the other brands, because of course there's like the typical brands that a lot of people will smoke just because oh this has like a cuban name or this has right. this or this family name that has been around you know forever these people are like hey i'm a new smoker and i actually love this cigar i love the bands i love this and i'm like that's fantastic that's how i learned about crown heads actually that's I have nice two to friends. Hear. yeah i actually have two friends in georgia that love the um the juarez okay Cool. And they're the ones that got me to try it. And I was like, this is actually pretty good. It's a great cigar. It's a great cigar. And, <laughs> and as far as the, the quality of the products go, I mean, you know, you have to give literally 100% credit to the factories and the people that work there and, and, and all of that. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm just a validator of all of that. But um, I mean, they're, they're, the, they're the heroes in our company. I wanted to ask you something regarding um, like friends coming up and asking for advice. Uh, if right now one of my friends came up to me and they weren't a, like an avid smoker, um, which crowned head cigar would you recommend? Like, let's say they have no idea what they like. It's not like, you know, Maduro, right. natural, like they just don't know. They don't know if they want spicy. They don't know if, if they like sweeter notes. What would you recommend? I think the, the entree to our portfolio uh, is probably going to be like Four Kicks, the original brand that we came out with in 11. I mean, because we literally created that particular flavor profile and that blend to be easily approachable, easily accessible, easily smokable so that a beginner can, can smoke it without being challenged. And yet it's complex enough that a seasoned enthusiast can still appreciate the, the nuances of the blend. I think four kicks is a good entree. And then I would fast forward to now and I would, I would give anybody 
uh, but they've never smoked a cigar or they've been smoking for years a mil dias mil dias to me it, it's yeah it's the newest one we've done but it's just there's something very unique and special to me about that blend that i could smoke anytime morning noon night so i would say either four kicks or mil dias so the mil dias it's like the the newest baby in the batch but also already at that level that you would say hey you know what yeah first no, release it's been good and here's the new one just as good i knew in january of 2020 when i when i smoked what would become the final blend that i was like this is it this is gonna this is gonna be something special it's a game and people smoked and like oh this is a game changer that was that kind of moment for me because we literally had been working on it on and off since 2017 and it was just something we just would tinker around with between luciano and and our office and um I remember January, he sent me a text. He goes, I, he goes, I think I got it. And I said, okay. And he sent it to me and I was like, wow. You know, and then during the pandemic, when I was working from home, I was smoking, that was all I was smoking the, the whole time. And I remember every time I smoked it, I was like, God, this cigar is so good. I can't wait to get it out. And then of course they, they canceled the trade show. So we haven't, you know, technically we haven't really launched Mil Diaz like at a trade show per se. So this will be a, an experience for more people to to experience that cigar in July at the PCA. So, but yeah, it it's it's a fantastic cigar. Very proud of it. We've already done two LEs on it. We've done the Moreva and we've done the Escogidos. And um, not to get too far ahead of myself, but there's one more planned for the the end of the year. So it's it's been great to work with uh, Tobacco Lara Pichardo. It is amazing that the um, Mil Diaz has done so well, considering that you didn't announce it at a trade show or something or bring it in as something like, hey, guys, this is new. A lot of the people just knew that it was a brand new cigar and they just started smoking, started trying. Word of mouth just gets around crazy. And right. that just brings me back to like the amazing Crown Heads fan base. And one question that I have in particular, um, it's about a promo that we ran a while ago. Mm. So you guys had some hats. Uh, and it was like we were selling or we were giving for free a hat with a box purchase. And that was the promo that we um, ran. It was mm -hmm. a fantastic promo. And people were calling us before we even got the hats. <laughs> and they oh, were like, funny. no, sign me up for the waiting list, please. Like, I need this hat. I need this hat. And I was like, whoa, what is like, I don't even know if we're getting this in. I would have to go out of my way and be like, hey, guys, have okay. you heard of this? And my friends were like sending me all the information. And I'm like, Oh my God, I have friends here. I have like my boss here. I'm like, asking, That's awesome. hey, trying to figure out all this information. That's so cool. why is Crown Head swag so popular? I mean, I, I, I like to think it is because we, I put as much attention to design and, and, and actual sample and quality and, and say a hat as we do as our cigars. Because I always felt like from the, from the jump, I was like, everything that we put our brand on has to be at a certain level of quality. I mean, you can go and buy a cheap blank hat and just go to an embroiderer and put crown heads on and give it away. But is that the message you want to convey to your, your end user? You want to convey, or we wanted to convey quality. Um, I wanted it to be something cool that I would wear. Like, I mean, not all I wear is crown head stuff and, you know, some other, a few other things, but for the majority of the time, it's like, I want to design something cool that I, I like wearing to, to show my brand. And that's just, it's just how it's caught on. And then really the game changer for me with, with the, the swag part of it, I guess, is that um, I met a, a guy, Derek here in Nashville through another friend and he repped this, this particular hat company. And um, he contacted me and said, Hey, you know, you can design anything you want. Like you don't have to take a black hat and then choose the color of stitch. He goes, you can, you can do the, the eyelets, you can do the undervisor, you could do this. You could, I was like, what? He said, yeah, you can sign everything. I'm like, oh my God. And then at the door opened wide for me and I'm like, all right, I'm going to town. And so now to this day, I've got a, a file like that thick of designs in the queue that I, I'm gonna pull on and just you know use and everything. But I'm constantly inspired by other stuff that I see. So then I'll take a screenshot of it. How do I tweak it? How do I revise it? How do we change it? How do I change the undervisor? What can we do cool here, there and whatever? So I put some, I put time into it, you know, and I think that people vibe with that and they get it and they enjoy wearing it. You know, I've got people like in the music business out here in Nashville that wear our stuff and they don't even know we're a cigar company. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, Hey man, cool shirt. Where'd you get it? And they're like, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, my buddy right. gave it to me. Yeah, exactly. Like, cool, that's, that's kind of the brand I work for, man. But <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I wanted to ask you also, so uh, regarding COVID and everything and everything closing, you know, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, everything, um, how have you, especially uh, during this pandemic, how have you kept customers excited about your products? I mean, you had no issue with the meal dias, but what about um, future stuff that you, your, you know, future stuff that's in the works? I mean, in retrospect, I kind of think the pandemic was like, was perfect for me. It was handmade for me. It was like a gift because like even before the pandemic, I was that guy that would not go out on the road. I don't travel. I mean, if I travel, it's to like trade show or uh, one event that we do in Hawaii or going to the, the TAA or what have you. But I don't do, you know, local stores or, you know, meet and greet, that kind of thing. I just never have because and it's simply not because I'm like bougie or anything like that, but it's just because from the very beginning, that's not what I wanted to build the equity in the brand about. I didn't want it to be based on a personality or a face. I wanted it to be based on the cigars and the brand image. And in order to do that, you got to pull yourself out of the equation to an extent. Otherwise, you're only as good as your presence there. So for me, as I was doing this like before the pandemic. And then when the pandemic hit and it just made me focus even more on, on getting the, the word out there through social media. That's my really my only avenue, my outlet to to get it out there because we didn't even have sales guys in, in stores to get the message out. So everything was my Instagram, you know, for the most part and a little bit of Twitter, but um, that's how it was tailor made for me because I wasn't traveling before the pandemic and I sure as hell didn't travel during the pandemic. So nothing really changed for me. I mean, I just, that's the way I get it out. I just like post my thing on Instagram, interact with my consumers and my retailers. And um, it, it's, it's fine for me. It worked the power of social media. Oh yeah. I mean, to be look, put it this way, 10 years into this, we still have yet to take one, one ad, one print ad at all. I mean, I think we may have taken an ad in cigar press because doors, a buddy of ours, but once, and that was it, but we have yet to, to bite the bullet and, and join the cigar aficionado team or whatever. And not that for whatever reason, I just, I just don't think it's necessary. I always felt like if we built up our, our core following to the point where they couldn't, they could not ignore the relevance of the brand, then they would jump on and we wouldn't have to advertise. And I'm seeing that a little bit to an extent, but I'm not, we have yet to do a print ad. I'm not saying we never would. I'm just saying 10 years into it, we don't, we don't advertise with anything but social media. Yeah, I mean, also when the cigars are good, you know, they kind of sell themselves. When you smoke something that's amazing, you tell your friends and they tell their friends. And then, you know, before you know it, they're buying whole boxes instead of singles, so. That's the, the best form of advertisement and I go back to I tell this story a lot like 2003 uh, I remember walking up to Pete Pete and I Pete Johnson from Tatuai he and I have been friends since oh god 1996 so in 2003 I went up to him at the trade show like we always do and I said what's good out there what should I smoke and he had this little cabinet of, of unbanded cigars and he said smoke this this is my cigar and I said what is it and he says Tatuai and I was like okay lit it up and immediately i'm like dude this is a game changer this cigar you know and then you look at the trajectory of that brand i mean it came out with what was high priced at that time it was like an eight to twelve dollar cigar in 2003 was expensive had a little paper band on it plain boxes and a cigar name that nobody could pronounce correctly for the most part he had everything working against him but i knew that because the cigar was such a good quality that that was going to be a success and now look what tatuai has evolved to and you know in the last two decades so that taught me a lesson that if the cigar is good people are going to find it you can put it in a paper bag it won't matter but people will know a good cigar when they smoke it yep and that helps a lot even with um your limited releases as far as not taking out ads anywhere you just post up a picture and people go crazy for them and you know that it's going to be sold out you don't even have to I mean, do anything it, else yeah. And in 2021, I mean, that's kind of like the way the whole world has shifted realistically. I mean, print is a dying form of media. I mean, for the most part, I mean, magazine companies are folding every day. I mean, not to wish ill on anybody, but in this day and age of electronic media and social media, it's so easy to just hit a button on the phone and 30,000 people are going to get that message that day for free, you know, until they start monetizing that kind of thing and making more money off of it. But 
it's just I'm just I'm just evolved with the time. And and we've, you know, back at CAO, we used to, we paid like ad agencies to come up with concepts and designs and we submitted ads and all, but it's just not necessary anymore for the most part. I hear you. It's different. It's a, it's a different time. It's mm -hmm. kind of like uh, that saying that was like, oh, build it and they will come. It's like blend it and they'll, they'll smoke. <laughs> that's, that's a, that would be a great ad if you did take an ad, blend it and they will come. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Oh, I wanted to ask you too. So I know that the four kicks, uh, you said that that original blend was um, manufactured by Ernesto, like one of his factories, and that your most recent, the Mil Diaz, was um, Tabacalero Pichardo. Correct. Correct. So do you guys have like, you know, now that I see that there's like different factories that you guys use, but is there one factory that you guys particularly like working with or do you just have like different partnerships? We have different partnerships. We have, we currently right now work with four factories. Technically we've got Tobacco Lara La Alianza, which is Ernesto Perez Carrillo. Mm -hmm. My father's cigars, which is the Garcia family. Tobacco Lara Pichardo, which is who makes Juarez and, and Mil Diaz and the TAA um, and Mother Church, the JR cigar. Um, and then we did a thing with uh, Drew Estate in 2019 called La Coalition. Um, so te technically we work with four factories. It's each one of them has their own nuances and, and styles and, and, and pros and cons to working with. So I kind of look at myself as more of like the creative director of a, of a fashion brand. Whereas, I mean, I may not be sewing the, the, the couture that you're going to buy, but I'm kind of like the producer that's kind of coordinating everything, you know? So that's, that's how I look at my role of working with those four factories, but each one of them is completely different. Like, you know, right now, I mean, as far as, seamless ease of functionality to working with tobacco Lara Pichardo has been a huge blessing for us because let's take Ernesto for instance you know obviously the pandemic he had a shutdown and then you know he's getting back up to speed but then lo and behold he gets the number one cigar of the year from Cigar Fishing Out magazine and overnight he's on back order for you know over a million cigars of pledge so you know I'm like oh now I got to deal with that so now, but with working with Tobacco Lara Pichardo, it's a lot easier that I can kind of do things, not on the fly, but I get better communication, more response, more, more, uh, more action. You know, Ernie's got his hands full and God bless him. He deserves it. He's like, you know, one of the Mount Rushmore guys of the cigar industry. Yeah. So you it's know like a I mean? blessing and a curse both. Yeah. And then, then you go to the, my father page and, and I love those guys too. And, you know, Pete was so instrumental in getting us even in the door with those guys. And, and you know, the, every year, you know, our big, to this day, our biggest selling brand, even though it's still technically an LE is Las Calaveras. I mean, yes, we sell it one time a year, but in terms of volume, it's bigger than anything we've done to this, this point, but you know, they've got their hands full too. I mean, that, that, that house is full. I can't really grow there that much because they've got a lot of great cigars they're producing between my father and Tatuaje. And I think they're still doing stuff for um, Ashton. So yeah, they, they have know? a couple for Ashton yeah. as well. So it's, and then with Drew Estate, they're just, they're so big that we're like this little blip on the map. And so we, it's hard for us to work with a house that big because their, their demands are on a different level. They're like, okay, we're doing production schedules six months out. So give me a six month projection and a 20% deposit. And your minimum order is, you know, 500 boxes per. And we're like, whoa, 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 you know, how can we project six months out? So, you know, everything has its pros and cons to it. So to this point, you know, working with uh, Luciano and, and the radio at Tobacco Lara Pichardo has, has been very comfortable for sure. And that's pretty cool. I mean, the, the fact that you could work with so many different people and you have that experience of kind of knowing like what you like and what you don't like at certain factories and what you would like in the future. Do you think there's ever a chance that if your brand got that big that you guys would want to start your own factory? I, you, I could definitely see the, the advantages of that. No, no question. Um, but in order to do that effectively, I think you have to be there. And neither Mike or myself are really at a stage of our lives where we could pick up our families and move to Esteli or, or wherever it may be. Um, it's just not in the cards. I mean, but yeah, I mean, I could see where we could have some sort of a financial interest in what would be our own factory for sure. I, I think that would be the next step. Um, and I would, that would be a dream for sure. No question. 
yeah, I'm sure if you could go back in time to like 1996 or even right before like 2010, uh, you would be like, wow, I'm going to have a brand that's going to grow so much that eventually I'll consider having a factory. Baby steps. <laughs> and just kind of yeah. like psych yourself out. <laughs> baby steps, baby steps. Yeah, we'll see. We'll so see I wanted to know if you were to go to an island tomorrow and only allowed to bring one box, which crowned heads line and Vitola would you choose? Why don't you just ask me like which of my children I like? Just one. Yeah, that's, right? that's I mean, my that's favorite. So that's why hard. I love asking this because people are like, damn, like which of my children would I choose? And I'm like, yeah, which one would you choose? <laughs> <laughs> that's almost Everyone impossible. has to have like one favorite, even I mean, if there's I, a couple of kids. <laughs> it's a good question. It deserves an answer. I would probably, I would, I would have to say that it, as of May 20th, 2021, I think it would be a box of Mil Diaz Double Robusto. It just, I mean, it's just the... The flavor profile for where I'm at and where my palate has evolved to is it's perfect for me. That size is perfect. I, I love that blend. I think that would be, you know, I started to think about four kicks because it was our first cigar, but I, you know, my, my palate, like everybody else is like, when you start drinking wine, you know, everybody starts with like maybe a, a Chardonnay and then they get into Pinot Noir, then they get into like heavier stuff and you end up with the, the Bordeaux and the cabs and everything. But then at some point, you kind of start going back and appreciate the subtlety of a Pinot Noir. And you go, oh, okay, now, now I can appreciate that for what it was. And I'm not looking for the big punch in the face, you know? And I think that's our, our style of cigars has kind of gone through that sort of evolution as well, where, you know, if you look at where we started and then in the middle, when you've got some heavier cigars like the Calaveras 14 or even the 16 were heavier, more robust cigars. And now I kind of think we're at a point where I'm just trying to, Put out products that are complex and balanced and just subtle and, and enjoyable and i think that's kind of where i'm at now so I, the answer to your question would be mil diaz double robusto i had a feeling you would say mil diaz especially because you said once uh, that was ready to come out like after the pandemic you were just smoking yeah. that a lot and you know you really get to enjoy a cigar once you smoke it a bunch of times after you're like you know this is actually fantastic and i, I could keep smoking this I, I love that cigar so much that I don't even throw the bands away. Every, every Mil Diaz I smoked, I put in a box, just that one cigar and it just on my desk. And I don't know, there's something very special uh, about that cigar for me, you know, but um, everybody's different. Everybody's palates are different. But I remember there's a gentleman <clears throat> by the name of George Brightman who used to work for Cigar Aficionado magazine during the boom. And he was one of my mentors coming up in the industry. Great guy, incredibly knowledgeable about tobacco and cigars and the industry as a whole. And he always, the thing that he instilled in my mind, one of the things was that you should create a cigar that's enjoyable, not a challenge to smoke. And over the years, I've seen the domestic market kind of go to the point where like guys, some guys want something that like, oh man, I, I started sweating and I need, I need to eat something. And oh, what a great cigar this is. To me, that sounds like a horrible experience. You know, a cigar should be something that you enjoy. It, it's the difference between, you know, if you want to have a drink to enjoy a cocktail or do you want to just do shots and get messed up, right? And I think that when some of these heavier cigars that come out, they're all like nicotine bombs and, and they taste just like black pepper. For some reason, the domestic market just goes gaga with those cigars. And I'm like, that's not what a cigar is supposed to be. I mean, you go back and smoke some of the best Cubans, they're not heavy, full body, powerhouse, pepper laden cigars. They're floral. They've got notes of leather and, and nuts and tea, and they're just complex and beautiful. And I think that's where cigar making is, is that's the, the, the art of it. And that's where, you, where we try to go with cigars like Mildias now. That is really interesting. And I mean, I just want to thank you for coming on today and uh, sharing all this expertise and all of this insight. And of course, for being here, part of the interview with us. And uh, my last question is, is there anything that you would like to tell the Neptune customers today? I'd like to tell you first and foremost, thank you for your support. And as we said, before we got on camera, I've gotten messages from no less than five or six people saying, I just bought a box of your TAA. Dot, 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 from Neptune. And they're all buying it from Neptune. So you guys are doing a phenomenal job. And I thank you guys for supporting our brand. Um, I will give you a little bit of a heads up, look for something coming from us May 26. I'm not sure when this is going to be posted. Um, and then I'm very excited to begin pre-promoting our PCA launch. So I will tell you this much. It's a regular production brand. It is also coming from Tobacco Charter, which I haven't shared with anybody. 
this is something that we started working on last year with these guys. And that's what I'm smoking right now, in fact. And um, it, again, incredibly excited to have everybody try this. It's, I have the same feeling about this as I did Mildeus. And to describe it, to give the little tease, if you can imagine a Mildeus with a little shot of testosterone in it, and this is what you're looking forward to in the summer. So. Okay. Wow. So they heard it here first. Uh, hopefully go. we do post this very soon yeah. so that people can jot down on their calendars, like May 26th. I think it was like June 4th or June 9th that you had said. May 26th is an LE that we're going to drop. And then mm -hmm. June the 9th will be the official announcement of Las Calaveras 2021. And then shortly thereafter, we'll start pulling the curtain back a little bit about this, what's coming up uh, for PCA. That's awesome. No, I... People are definitely going to be jotting down their calendars. I'm telling you, Thank you, you guys have, have done a fantastic job. And I really hope that your new cigar does have uh, as much, you know, like lives up to the hype as much as the real so has had so far. I hope so too. I would hate to see it do otherwise, but you never know. No, You guys are going to be fine. You guys will be fine for sure. You've been fine thank for you. this long. So, you know, it's only up from here. Not but thank you so much for being here. Cheers. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Of course. We hope to have you back in the future sometime, especially after all those new releases hit. Okay. Anytime, anytime. All righty, John. Have a good one. All Take right. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.